Hey everybody, this is Professor Mankowski, and in this video, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna begin the introduction to chapter seven, section seven one. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch screens here, get us some presentation material. Okay, now where chapter seven begins is almost an afterthought of where chapter six left off. And in chapter six, we found out if somebody gives us some information about a population, like they give us an average and they give us a standard deviation, we can use that information to assess the behavior of a sample or predict the behavior of a sample that we take from that population. And in particular, what we're talking about when we say predict the behavior of a sample is what the sample average is going to do. So how do we go from knowing about the population to knowing about the sample when it comes to the actual mathematics? Uh, mathematics? And the answer is, that's what the central limit theorem does. So there's the formula that we've been using so far for the central limit theorem formula. And while it all sounds really good on paper, there's this one little problem that pops up. And it's that most of the time in real life, we're not going to know anything about the population. So if we don't know anything about the population, it's kind of like, hold on a second, how are we supposed to start predicting behavior of a sample? And statisticians grappled with that idea, and they said, well, most of the time, even if we don't know anything about a population, we could still take a sample from it. So they came up with this bright idea, and they said, why don't we try to use the central limit theorem backwards? And we can use a sample to tell us everything that we need to know about the population. And that's exactly what we're going to do in chapter seven. We're going to be using all kinds of information about samples to help us try to predict what's going to happen in a population. So to get us rolling into an introduction, I want you guys to think about the presidential election coming up. And in the presidential election, we have Joe Biden that's run. And Joe Biden is probably going to need to know his approval rating. So Joe Biden is going to hire a statistician and say, I want you to go out and find my approval rating. If that statistician figures out that Joe's approval rating is 52%, we look at that, we think this is pretty decent because 52%, it's more than half, it's enough to win an election. So if that statistician reports to Mr. Biden 52%, Mr. Biden's going to turn around and immediately fire that statistician. Now, why would he do that? The reason why is because if we use just one number to serve as an estimate for a population parameter, that's really risky because it won't give us the complete story. It's a lot safer to use an interval to estimate something. So if we used an interval, let's take a look at what might happen. If we're up here at the high end, 54%, Looking pretty good for Mr. Biden because 54% is enough to win the election. So Joe Biden's feeling pretty good. But if we're on the low end, 48% is not enough to win an election. So it would mean Joe Biden has a lot of work to do. So our main takeaway here is that if we have to do an estimate, and we're going to estimate all kinds of different population parameters, averages, variances, standard deviation, you name it. Uh, section 7-1 is going to start with population averages. A big takeaway is that we always want to use an interval to estimate an average because it's much safer. Now, when we get into the mechanics of our formula, there's some heavy lifting in there. And one of the most critical aspects is one part that we're going to review of the normal distribution before we get into the Chapter 7 formulas. So let's go back to the election for a minute. Joe Biden knows that the election is coming up. So he says to a statistician, I want you to go out, estimate my approval rating, and I need you to be 90% accurate. So statistician is going to look at that 90% and same 90% we have up on screen. What we're going to do is we're going to calculate something brand new. We're going to calculate what's our alpha level. Now our alpha level, alpha is a new symbol. You need to know alpha. We're going to see alpha everywhere. Alpha is the area left for both of our tails. How do we calculate alpha? Well, we know the total area under our curve is 100%. So what we're going to do is do 1 minus 90%, and that's going to give us 10%. We're going to take it a step further, and we're going to take that 10%. We're going to figure out how much area is in each individual tail. So to do that, we're going to go ahead, and we're going to take alpha. We're going to divide it by 2 lets us know that in each tail, 
we're going to have 5% of the area of the curve. So our next move, now we're going to find out what's the Z value that corresponds to the lowest 5% of that curve. We're going to pull out our Z table and we're going to look for the lowest 5% of the area on that table. And remember, if your area 5% is if, if it is exactly in between two areas, you're always going to take the Z score that corresponds with the Z value that's furthest away from zero. So that means the low side of the curve is going to be minus 1.65. To get the highest side of the curve, we found out in chapter six that we can just take the negative 1.65 and we can flip the sign on it. That's going to give us 1.65. Okay, so guess what? Now the election's coming up sooner. The election is three months away. So Joe Biden needs to be more accurate. Says to his statistician, I want you to estimate my approval rating, but this time I want you to be 95% accurate. So we're going to start off the same way. We're going to calculate our alpha level. Our alpha level is going to be 5%. We're going to find out how much is in each tail. And in each tail, we're going to have two and a half percent. And now we're going to go and do the same process again. We're going to locate that two and a half percent on our Z table. And we're going to find out that the low side is going to be negative 1.6. The high side is going to be positive 1.96. Okay. Now the election is the night before. I mean, it's the night before the election. So Joe Biden says to his statisticians, I need to know everything. I need you to give me 100% accuracy. And the statistician says, well, we can't do 100%. We would need a crystal ball for that, but we'll give you 99%. So what I want you guys to do is take a minute, see if you can find out what the Z scores are gonna be on the low side and the high side. Pause the video if you need to. Okay, so we're gonna do exactly the same procedure that we did before. We're gonna find our alpha level, that's gonna be 1%. The area in each individual tail will be 0 0.005. When we go to match with our Z table, we're gonna find out that the low side of our curve is gonna be minus 2.58. The highest side is gonna be positive 2.58. So that's gonna give us information on how to find the confidence level associated with our estimation. And in each question, we're gonna have a different confidence level. It might be 95%, sometimes it might be 99%, uh, 92%. So each time the percentage will change. And we're going to have to know how to dig out the corresponding Z levels each time. Okay, so let's get into a little bit more specifics of the actual formula that we're going to use. If we have a friend that comes to visit us, and we're going to use our imagination here, and our friend says, I need you to go ahead um, and let me know if I can borrow your car. I'm going to be staying with you for a few days. I know you're at work all day. Is it okay if I borrow your vehicle? And we say to our friend, well, it, vehicle kind of eats a lot of gasoline. So if you don't mind, just pay for fuel, pay for what you use. And your friend says, well, okay, that seems pretty fair to me. How much does gasoline cost around you? And you really want to impress your friend with the statistics course. So you go to 30 different gasoline stations and you're able to figure out the average cost of gasoline is $2.25. And you say to your friend, $2.25, uh, give or take about 10 cents. So from this information, our $2.25 is gonna be what we call a point estimate. A point estimate is when we just use one number to serve as an estimate for our population parameter, in this case, a population average. And the give and take portion is what we're gonna to refer to as our error. Now, from just those two bits of information, our friend can infer a formula together, or rather not a formula, but an interval between low price and a high price of how much they should expect to pay at the pump. They're going to figure they can pay anywhere between $2.15 and $2.35 for fuel. So that's kind of the basic idea of how our estimation formula is going to work. Now we're going to make it a little bit more sophisticated and be by making it more sophisticated, I just mean that we're going to go ahead and we're going to start to put symbols into our point estimates and our errors.
So our point estimate is going to end up being our sample average. And our error term is going to end up being made of two components. The component on the left is the z alpha over 2 is going to come from the confidence level that we need. And the portion on the right is going to come from sigma divided by the square root of n. Now that part in purple, how did that get there? What's that coming from? And the answer is that goes back to the central limit theorem. We might remember that when we did the central limit theorem, we found out that the distribution of all possible sample averages would have a standard deviation equal to sigma divided by the square root of n. And that's something that also shows up in our formula. When we do the central limit theorem formula, our denominator was sigma divided by the square root of n. So at the end of the day, if all of this seems a little overwhelming, all you have to remember is that this is going to be our formula that we're going to use. And there is some good news. Most of the information in our question is just going to be plugged in directly into the formula. The challenging part, if anything, in the math that we're going to do is going to come in from trying to figure out what the z values are that we'll use. So it's a pretty good idea, if you need to, to go ahead and review the three different curves that we had just discussed. And to get some more practice in our textbook, page 366, number nine, they give some really great practice on just giving you the confidence level and asking you to come up with the different z values for each confidence level. And that'll prep you for what's probably going to be the most challenging part of our interval formula. So now let's go ahead. Let's get a practice exercise on screen and let's work through it. If you need to pause for just a second the video and read through it. Okay, so it seems like in this question, number 18, somebody is probably trying to open a daycare center and they're figuring a pretty good important uh, piece of intel to have is to know how much to charge for daycare. So they go out, they sample uh, a whole bunch of different places to figure out uh, how much money these institutions are charging. And uh, they're going to base their estimate on that. They'd like us to do a population average estimate. So first thing I'm going to do is just write down every number that came up inside that question. And now we're going to go back in and we're going to see if we can identify all the context clues that will help us figure out what symbol each number is. The first number they gave me was a 50. And when I look at the 50, the 50 seems to be the number of items or the number of objects that are in my study. So I'm feeling pretty good about labeling my 50, my sample size n. The next number was 3,987. And it's mentioned coinciding with the word average. So at this point, I can narrow things down to I'm either talking about my population average or my sample average. So either mu or x bar. How do I figure out which one is which? Well, what I can do is I can notice that that information is linked back to the sample size of 50. So it's probably telling me that that 3,987 is going to be my x bar. The 630 is next on the list, and that 630 is mentioned with the context of the population standard deviation. So it's probably the case that 630 is my sigma. And the last one that I have to watch out for is 90% confident. And 90% confident is going to belong to my z-score. And my z alpha over 2, which I figured out from previous videos, is going to be equal to plus or minus 1.65. So now what I'm going to do is I have everything I need to solve the question. I'm going to take all the information. I'm going to load it up into my formula. And now we're going to see how that plus and minus part plays out into our formula. So I'm going to do the left side first. I'm going to go ahead and say my x bar was 3,987. And for the left side, I'm only using the negative sign. I'm going to fill in the right side exactly according to the symbols that I've attached to each number. And it's going to tell me the low side will be $3,840. The high side, I'm going to start out with 3,987. And the only difference in the formula on the right side is my negative is going to switch over to a positive. The rest of my numbers are going to be exactly the same. So when I calculate this out, I'm going to end up with 4,134. So my final answer to the question, what I need to do is I need to 
quote my interval, but at the same time, I have to mention the probability because there's a certain probability attached to the population average being in between those numbers. So I'm going to say I am 90% confident that the yearly tuition is in between $3,840 and $4,134. And we're almost completely done now. The only other aspect that I have to figure out is they asked me uh, in the end, bring everything back up on the screen here. The last question they gave me was, if the daycare center is starting up and they want to keep tuition low, what should be a reasonable amount to charge? Now, key word here is they want the tuition low. So that means I probably want to stay around my $3,840 because I need to be competitive. Okay, let's do another practice exercise. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take a look at number 14. So take a minute to read number 14, and then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do same procedure. Okay, uh, rather that was number 17, sorry. Number 17, so first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna list all the numbers down just like before that I had earlier. And when I'm looking at this, uh, I'm gonna to start to read in and find out how to label things. When they gave me 415, 415 kindergartners are in the study. So 415 is probably my sample size N. For 5,000, 5,000, they're using the word average. And again, that could be either sample average or population average. So how do I know what to do with that? Well, 5,000 is connected to 415. So that's telling me it's part of the information they were giving me when they covered what was happening in the sample. So it's safe to say my 5,000 must be my X bar. To get my 900 figured out, when they said 900, they were talking about a standard deviation of the population. So my 900 must be my sigma. Uh, 4,000 is actually next, but it's not really used for anything. And I could tell that because it doesn't seem to be connected to the population. It's an outside piece of information that somebody gave me uh, that I'm supposed to use at some point, but it's not really connected to the sample. So it's probably going to be used for later on. The final number, 95% confidence, must be related to my Z alpha over 2 value. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to write in that that's probably going to match my Z alpha over 2 value of 1.96. So now I've got everything all keyed into place. I'm going to start to figure out my formula. And pause the video. See if you can get the low side figured out. See if you can get the high side figured out. Okay. So the low side is going to be x bar minus the 1.96 times my 900 divided by the square root of 415. And that's going to give me 4,913 hours. The high side, again, the only difference is going to be the minus is going to turn into a positive. The rest of the numbers are exactly the same. So my high side will be 5,087. So what I know now is that my answer to the question is I'm 95% sure that kindergartners are watching between 4,913 hours and 5,087 hours of television. It looks like they asked us one question at the end and that's where we're gonna use the 4,000 hours. They said if a parent claimed that his children watched 4,000 hours, would that claim be believable? Now, if I look at the interval, the low side of the interval is 4,913, and 4,000 hours is well below 4,000. So being that that number is so far below the low side, I feel pretty good about saying that that claim probably isn't believable. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at one special part of the question that we didn't really think about yet. When I look at the question number 17, inside of the information, think about the sample size. The sample size was 415. So how did they know to use exactly 415 kindergartners? 
how come they didn't use 420 kinder, kindergartners or 330 kindergartners? Why made them pick 415? Uh, when we looked at number 18, what was the sample size? Sample size was 50. So how did they know that you had to use 50 time out? How come not 80 or how come not 30 or 40? When, uh, if we look at number 15 in the book, they used 35. So what made them use 35? Uh, question 13, they used a sample size of 50. So why that number? And what we're kind of getting at is how do you know what to use for your sample size? Our fast answer is in statistics, we always want to use the biggest sample we can possibly use. Uh, it's gonna be better, of course, to base an estimate on as large as a sample as you possibly can. But the problem is that sometimes we won't always be able to get a huge, enormous sample. Uh, we're gonna be limited by things like uh, money. We'll have a budget maybe. We only have a certain amount of time. Uh, we might not have enough people to get the largest sample that we need to. So how do we figure out what's the minimum sample size that we can get by with? Like what's the lowest that we can cut through with and still be safe? So how do we figure that out? We're gonna have to go back to our formula and we're gonna have to look at one special aspect of it that we haven't really considered yet. If we just place our attention on the right side, we know that the right side of this is gonna be our error term. Now inside of the question, when we're trying to do an estimate for somebody, or somebody needs us to estimate a population average, most of the time, they'll be able to give us the confidence level they need. If we know the population standard deviation, and we also have a person telling us what their error is, technically, we have an equation with four things in it. That means that three of those things we know. We should be able algebraically to figure out what's gonna be our value for the sample size. So algebraically, we should be able to manipulate this equation to tell us the sample size we need to match A, our confidence level, B, the error, well, uh, the error level, and C, the population standard deviation. Now, how do you actually do that algebraically? Well, in your textbook, they've given us a little bit of information. They said if we have our minimum sample size formula, we can turn around and we can actually rearrange that using some um, algebraic gymnastics and we can solve for n. Uh, don't worry about how we algebraically manipulate the equation because that's gonna be way too much to go through on a video lecture. At the end of the day, all we have to remember is that our formula for what we're going to call minimum sample size is going to be equal to this right here. So if you're going to use minimum sample size formula, how do you know when it's time to do that? The answer is there's going to be a few key words that our authors are going to use to let us know it's time to do that. Whenever we see a question and they're asking us to estimate a minimum sample size and they use the specific words, be off by no more than or within, that's letting us know it's time to use our minimum sample size formula. So let's go ahead, let's put it to work. We're gonna do uh, question number 24 here and take a minute, uh, read through number 24, pause the video if you need to. Okay, so we're gonna start out doing what we used to do before. We're gonna just write down all the numbers that they gave us. And we've got 95%, we have uh, 0 0.15 and 0.26. Let's find out what each one is. Our 95% is gonna be, no doubt, uh, information for our confidence level. So we're gonna put in plus or minus 1.96. Our 0.15 is gonna be inside the question with the word within. So we know we have to do a average estimate, but we have to be within 15 cents of the real cost at stake. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna assign 0.15 equals E for error. As for the 26, that's mentioned along with the standard deviation, so we're gonna assign that a value of sigma. Or we're, rather, we're gonna make that equal to our symbol for sigma. Now we're gonna fill into our formula here and be really careful when you do your formula because the most common mistake is we forget the square. 
And you can forget the square and not even realize it when you get to your final answer because there won't be anything suspicious looking about the answer. So you just have to kind of etch that into your memory. When we fill out the numbers, this is what we're going to get. And our final answer is going to be we have 11.5. And we're going to go ahead, we're going to round that up to 12. And we're going to say that if we want to do this estimate to find out uh, the cost of pizzas, we have to use a minimum of 12 pizzas if we want to do it to an accuracy within 15 cents and 95% confidence.